because that's what happened last week. I tried to record these for my mom, and last week it didn't record. And like there, I just like pushed the button and the thing moved down, but it wasn't on. But now it's on, and it's, it's got the red light, so it must mean it's working. Um, all right, so yes, James part four, chapter one, verses 19 through 27, talking about God's word, receiving God's word. So far, um, James has been talking about tests. In fact, the book of James is about tests or evaluations of your faith. Are you a true believer? Here's how you can tell type of things. And so, you know, the first was the response to trials. How do you respond to trials? Is it with joy? Um, knowing that God's in charge and that these things are happening for a reason. Uh, the second test was the response to temptation. When we are tempted, do we blame God or do we look at other factors in our flesh and the world and the devil? And so the third response uh, test today is the response to the truth revealed in God's word. So how do we receive God's word? Usually, when a disciple, a true disciple, hears God's word, they like it, the, the truth. I mean, you know, when the truth is revealed, hey, that you're a sinner uh, in need of a savior, and here's a savior, Jesus, that's, that's a great truth, and, and we wanna know more about him. And so we have this uh, hunger for God's word. That is one of the more reliable evidences of genuine salvation. And so James is focusing on a major truth related to that evidence that saving faith is marked by a proper reception of scripture as the word of God. So we're, we're looking at this uh, a couple of ways today. One as that test, that evaluation of how we receive God's word, but also as, as a training, a process, if you will. Uh, the army has manuals for everything and in the army leadership manual, and as an outline for training soldiers, and it is crawl, walk, run. You have to crawl before you walk when you're a baby. Uh, you have to be able to learn, learn the smaller things before you can walk in the bigger things, before you can run with the biggest things. And so if you think of any type of training, um, I wanna stay away from martial type training, but let's see. <sighs> You know, I, I thought I knew how to do laundry and fold clothes, and then I went to boot camp. It was actually in the Navy, but uh, if you think about that, you know, you're issued a set amount of gear, and then you're issued a locker that's barely big enough to fit that gear. And if you just shove it in there like I used to do with my clothes, it wouldn't work. You had to fold it just right, and it had to be all lined up, and the creases had to be just so, and, you know, so. The crawl phase of that is, here's the stuff that's issued to you, here's why you need to fit it in there. Walking, here's how you fold it and put it away, and then running, how you keep on going, taking care of these things. And so, with anything, you know. Uh, and so we're looking at that today, crawl, walk, and run with the Bible. So, to crawl, the first thing we must do is receive the Word properly. And as we get into that, let's prepare our hearts to do that through prayer. Gracious and loving God, we do thank you again for your word that you have given us and how it is a beautiful thing from you, a revelation of who you are and how we can and are to live our lives for you in response to your love, in response to your salvation through Jesus Christ. So open our eyes to see and our ears to hear and our hearts to understand your word today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So we've talked about trials and temptations and uh, previously James said every good and gift and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow. And then he says in verse 18, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And so tying to that then this next section, verse 19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person, and by the way, he's not leaving out you sisters, okay, that's brothers and sisters, know this, my beloved brethren, 
Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. All right. Isn't that great? Key phrase in those three verses is receive with meekness the implanted word, referring to the word of God, a.k.a. scripture, a.k.a. the Bible. Be quick to hear the word, because that's the key thing. He's talking about the word. Be quick to hear the word and what it says about your life in Christ. Be slow to speak means paying attention. Too often people, when they're in conversations or hearing things, they're, they're not really listening that they're waiting for a break, an opportunity to express their own thoughts and what they're speaking, want to speak their mind. People are distracted in their thoughts and their selfishness, thinking about the things they need to do after reading the Bible or listening to a sermon. They don't focus on God's Word when they, that should be their only focus. Slow to anger comes from our natural desire to defend ourselves and our lives whenever someone questions or corrects us. We put up walls to protect ourselves and get angry when we're told we're doing something wrong. So, when the Bible corrects us, or someone corrects us and says, you know, I think the Bible has something to say about what you're doing there, our natural reaction is defensiveness, and defensiveness often leads to anger. So, these verses are about Scripture doing those things. Now, all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We're all about the teaching, not so much about the rebuking or the correcting, sometimes about the training in righteousness. It is good for all those things, not just hearing about salvation through Jesus Christ. It does teach that, certainly, and Romans Road, many other verses in the Bible. But once we've experienced true conversion, there should be a hunger for God's, God's Word. What, what more does it tell us? and for allowing it to change our lives. This is the test of a true believer, how they receive the Word. Receiving the Word with an open heart and mind and seeking to find its truth and apply it to one's life is the passing score. I like verse 19, all right? Uh, it illustrates layers of Scripture, like a cake or an onion, layers nuggets of truth that are contained there just waiting to be mined by the diligent <coughs> Christian. First, there's plain, simple truth, right? Be quick to hear, slow to speak. Simple truth about active listening and anger control. You can take it at that level and, and do okay. If everyone in the world were quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to anger, the world would be a much better place. But if we go deeper, we get to see these actions tied to receiving Scripture in our lives. And we should be actively listening to Scripture, seeking to live our lives according to its truths and reject the filthiness and rampant wickedness in the world. If we just try to be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger in our own power, we're just conducting behavior modification. And that's not what God is about. That is what the Pharisees were about. That is what hypocrites are about, just trying to do your best. No, the saving power of God's Word, the transforming power of God's Word, is implanted in us at conversion. And we want to live in that. We are justified by faith. We are sanctified through the application of Scripture in our lives. And at the end, we're glorified in eternity in heaven with God. His Word, His power, not our own efforts. Submission to the Word of God is the crawling phase in our training for righteousness. Because if we're not listening to this Word, if we're not receiving it with open hearts, we're not going to live it out and do what it says. Crawling. Here's how we do that. We read, we study, we ask for meaning. We hear what the Word of God is saying, what God is saying through His Word for our life, without defensiveness or arguments or excuses. Pursue every opportunity to read the Word, to hear it preached and taught, and discuss it with other believers who love, honor, and seek to obey it. No matter that we know, or in spite of the fact that we know, that it's going to tell us to change. I mean, we 
know things that we're doing we're not supposed to, know things that we should do that we're not, and it's going to tell us that. But rather than ignoring it or avoiding it, we should dive into it and allow God to do His work in our lives. We have to crawl before we can walk, and to crawl is to receive God's Word properly. When we do that, then we can start walking to the next phase, which is doing God's Word. James says in verse 22, I'm sure we're all aware of this, Be doers, but be doers of the Word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, be no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So, in these verses, James says, those who hear the word of God and do it will be blessed. And those who don't are fooling themselves. Walking means putting into practice the truths that are revealed in your diligent study of Scripture, which means you have to be studying it to know what it says so you can put it into practice. If the only Scripture you hear is the weekly sermon and you say you are a Christian, James says you may want to reevaluate re your relationship with Jesus. In the long run, how we behave is proof of our salvation or of our lostness. And in light of that truth, there's good reason to believe that there are countless men, women, and children who come to church regularly, make a strong profession of being a Christian, but whose lives testify they are not. They regularly listen to the preaching of the word, claim to believe it, discuss it favorably with fellow church members, but their hearts are devoid of the saving, transforming grace of God. Jesus declared unequivocally, unequivocally in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 22, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. They may be fooling others, but not God. And sadly, they may even be fooling themselves into thinking they have a saving relationship with Jesus. Now, let me just stray for a second here. Um, you know the parable about the sower and the seeds? I've had it uh, postulated, proposed, suggested to me that that may very well be like a ratio. Scatter the seed on the path, the birds ate it, rocky soil, the withered soil with weeds, they choked out the cares of the world, but some sprouted and grew and delivered a 30, 60, 100 fold yield. Now if you look at it that way, then you're looking at like 25% of the people who hear the Word of God are actually going to respond in a way to be saved. It's an interesting thought. Yeah. Continuing on. <laughs> I bet every one of us looked in a mirror before we came here this morning. I can look out there and see, yes, you did. And I'll also bet that none of us could describe what we look like well enough for a sketch artist to draw a reasonably accurate portrait. Why? Well, we know what we look like. We see ourselves every day in the mirror. We know when things look right, and if they don't, then we fix them so they look right, and then we move on. That's all we're looking for. If something's off, we want to fix it, and then we don't give it another thought. We don't study our image because we know what it's supposed to look like. And this is what James is saying, right? That if a person professes to be a Christian, they may know, oh yeah, the Bible tells about Jesus, and you know, I believe in him, and he died for my sins, and that's good. But they don't study it, they don't get into it, they don't allow it to, to change their lives. But the one who does, who looks at the perfect law, which is scripture, perseveres, he will be blessed. 
If professing Christians only hear the word, don't do what it says, they are deceiving themselves. Being forgiven of sins is not a pass to continue sinning. The first sermon that Jesus preached was, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. He came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. Therefore, as his followers, we are to obey and do what Scripture tells us to do. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. So walking means having read, studied, and asked for meaning and heard what God is telling us about our lives through his scripture. We do it. There may be a specific issue you're struggling with. Uh, it may be something that just your eyes open, you're reading scripture every day, hopefully, and suddenly a passage means something to you at that time. If you're struggling with something, you you know the Holy Spirit may be prompting you to do something, study what the Bible says about it, ask God to help you with it, and then do it. These are good things to do, and we can improve our relationship with God this way. However, right, crawl, walk, run is a process, not a procedure, and it should be our goal to constantly improve our life in Christ. We can hear the word, we can do the word, and finally, we can live the word. This is the running phase, James 26 and 27. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Now, many people in Jesus' time thought they were religious. Pharisees come to mind, Sadducees. Many were religious, but had no relationship with God. And many people today think that attending church, doing volunteer work, participating in other outward forms of religion make one a good Christian. But these things are worthless without a heart for God and a true saving faith in Jesus. And one of the best ways to evaluate your faith is in the tongue, your speech. A tongue that's not controlled by God is sure evidence of a heart that's not controlled by God. Jesus says, what comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And all the outward acts of religion with an unbridled tongue are a sign of worthless religion. So to end on a positive note, James defines what true religion looks like, helping others in need, particularly when they can't return the favor and purity from their world. In his time, the people that uh, were the most helpless were widows and orphans. Widow with no family, had no way to take care of herself. Orphans, again, no family, no support system. There was no social services. There was no big government to help out people. They were on their own. And so there's no way that, you know, helping out a widow, that she would be able to pay you back. And so this is the true religion, helping those who, who can't return the favor. You're showing them love selfless love, meeting their needs, pursuing them, pleasing them, that is love. Now, because of our selfish nature, helping others is not natural at first. <coughs> but this is where we really get to running. Like, this is where we do it. Jesus let nothing get in the way of serving others indeed, because it was naturally who he was. He came to serve and not be served. And so as Christians, we're in that process of sanctification where we're becoming more and more like Jesus in our lives. And the more we receive the word and do it, the more we will live it out like Jesus did. So that living the word means naturally living a Christ-like love, life, Christ-like life of loving God and loving people. And it comes with practice like most things. But it is one of those things, you know. As you run, uh, and if you do it diligently, you can get faster, you can run longer, whatever your goal is. If you're diligently pursuing scripture and living it in your life and living like Jesus, then more and more it will become a natural thing to just do. Crawl, walk, and run. Hear, do, and live the word of God. I, I really can't imagine life without God's word in my life. I read every morning. I have reading plans where I just read. And, and I read to consume mass quantities of, of Scripture. And it's not studying, it's just reading. Reading it over and over again. Every year, at least once a year, I read through the Bible, cover to cover. Uh, sometimes twice a year. 
We did the Bible in 90 days at the start of this year, right? So that was once, but I've also been reading it cover to cover again, so that that'll be twice this year that I've read cover to cover. And I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you, this is how I incorporate it into my life. Preaching, I have to study. Sunday school, I have to study. But I'm also, you know, journaling through scripture and just all of these things to make it a part of my life. We do this with things, whether it's TV, hobbies, work, but we have the Word of God. We should incorporate it into our lives. I notice a difference in the day when I don't start the day by reading the Bible. I would rather read it than anything else, and I read a lot, and I read widely a variety of things, but I would rather read the Bible than even a good Jack Reacher novel. I learn something every time I study it. My life has vastly improved as I've put into practice the truths that it teaches. And it helps me make sense of a world that oftentimes seems senseless. Senseless things happen. But what I've learned in scripture helps me make sense. When something senseless and tragic happens, the world is a fallen sinful place. This is not how it was meant to be. God intended something better and is calling us to something better in eternity. And our response to God's word is another test of our Christian faith. Do we receive, do, and live it, or do we reject, defy, and ignore it? Prayerfully, you do the first and not the last. But as we spend some time going through James, thinking about how is my faith, I was thinking this morning, you know, we, we've got this life and this whole life to do it, to live our life for God. And, you know, tests of faith. How do you deal with trials? How do you deal with temptation? How do you respond to God's word? The ultimate test of faith comes on our last day here on earth. That was my thought this morning. That's the one that really counts. But we get all these evaluations along the way and thank God for that, for his grace and allowing us to live this life. So I pray that we live it more and more for him. Thank you, Lord, for today, for this word, for these evaluations that James has given us, Lord. And I pray that uh, as we think about our relationship with you, that we focus on, on that 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 is what it is. It is a relationship. It's not a test. It's not a, a work assignment. Do so many good things, read so many chapters of scripture. But we do these things to know you more, to draw closer to you. You love us. You loved us first. And I pray that we love you in response. And, and that love is shown and how we treat our relationship with you. May we value it. May we adore it. And may you bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so this is a uh, new song. I mean, maybe you've heard it before, but maybe not. <laughs>